celebrating 40 seasons on the air. Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, are you prepared for a possible disaster? MSU Extension is here to help. We'll examine what Extension does to educate people on how to protect family, pets, livestock, and property when natural and man-made disasters occur. You've already got that big, beautiful garden. Now, make it better by adding in some butterflies. We'll tell you the types of flowers you'll want to plant to make your garden a haven for your fluttering friends. Looking for ways to get those eight glasses of water a day? Try mixing things up by mixing things in. The Food Factor will give us some ways to take the drab out of your drink. And meet two sisters who credit 4-H with putting them on the path to careers as veterinarians. Hear their story and what they're doing to give back to the community. Farm Week starts right now. I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. Are you prepared for a disaster like a flood or a tornado? It is a question we often ask ourselves, but do you really know the steps to take if your farm or your family is put in harm's way? That's right. Farm Week's Amy Myers is here to tell us about some services that are available as we begin gearing up for severe weather season. Amy? Mississippi State has always provided assistance to those in need through various educational programs, workshops, trainings, and other sources, but there's one service you might not be familiar with until you really need it. MSU Extension works to educate Mississippians about taking simple steps to prepare not only themselves, but also pets and livestock for natural disaster. Part one of this two-part series highlights what you can do ahead of time to reduce the stress of a potential disaster. When natural disasters like flooding, tornadoes, or hurricanes strike, we often learn about unfortunate situations where residents are left stranded. Additionally, pets and livestock often get injured, lost, or even stolen leaving us to question if these circumstances could have been prevented. Many times, the answer is yes. Mississippi State University yeah, Extension VR. instructor Ann Hilbin says the house. first step to keeping yourself, family, and animals safe is preparing to live self-sustainably for at least three days, whether you plan to evacuate or not. That's so important that you have enough water. And remember, with water, you want to have a gallon of water per day per person. So if you get those 24 pack cases of water at the grocery store, that's three gallons of water. So that's one person for three days. Your first aid kits, you need to have that that helps you be prepared in case there are any injuries. Because remember that during that first 72 hours, emergency services may be delayed. You wanna have food items that are non-perishable. So your canned goods, um, with that, you want to switch that out as well because they have expiration dates. If you have meals ready to eat, that's always a good idea because it's all together, it's right there. You want to make sure that you've got a radio so you can get information because the TV may not work. Plus your clothing. I mean, if you're evacuating, you want to make sure you have at least three days of clothes. Other essential items include a large battery supply, flashlights, bug spray, eyeglasses, contact lenses, prescribed medications, gasoline, updated road maps, and children's items. You also want a cash supply, both small bills and change. If you know anyone who's elderly, make sure their to-go kits are updated and ready. Also, be sure to make a kit for your pets. Hilbin says in the event of an evacuation, there are shelters available for evacuees with pets. If they are on any medications, you need to bring their vaccination records. Now the thing about shelters, they have a tendency to fill up quickly. So make sure when you decide which shelters you're going to go to, you have a backup plan because they're spread throughout the state so that 
you can bring your animals with you, but they're not all the same. Some of them are just for people. Some of them are for special functional needs. You want to have a good idea of where those types of facilities are and how close they are together. If you do leave animals behind, never leave them in crates or tied to posts because if it floods, they have no way to escape from drowning. Of course, the same principle goes for livestock. The safest location to leave animals depends on the type of disaster. If a tornado or high wind is predicted, move them to lower ground. In case of a flood event, place them on higher ground. MSU College of Veterinary Medicine Associate Professor Dr. Carla Houston has essential livestock preparation reminders. There's really three phases to preparedness. There's the general preparedness that you do way ahead of time um, throughout the year, and then there's uh, preparedness about 72 hours before if you know an event's going to occur, and then preparedness within 24 hours. What you don't want to do is put them in a pasture where there's a lot of loose wire, loose fencing, or electric power lines. If there's a, um, a concern with flooding, you don't want to put them into a pasture that has a lot of streams running through them. Also, walk your property and remove any objects that could fly up and hit an animal. Tie ribbons to any loose fencing so animals can see where boundaries are. Furthermore, proper identification is imperative. We all hear the stories and we probably see the stories on the news and the sad stories about the lost pets and the lost horses or the lost cattle. We have seen cases of thefts of both small animals and large animals after a disaster um, where people offer to come and help and haul their animals or take them to a shelter or a safe facilities and you never hear from them again. The most fail-proof identification methods include a registered brand, tattoo under the upper lip, electronic ID tag, and official state animal tag. Using brightly colored livestock spray paint, write contact information on the side of the animal. Furthermore, Houston explains what you need in your livestock preparedness kit, as well as other preparations. To make sure that you have a, a source of water or feed, make sure you have at least two weeks of medications, in a safe place, in a waterproof storage area in the house. Um, make sure you have vaccination records, individual animal ID, photos of animals, for example, photos of livestock. Um, any in horses, you want to make sure you have a copy of things like Coggins um, tests, bandages, gauze, tape, and wrap. Check the, tra the trailer tires. Um, teach your horse to load, because if you've got to evacuate, that's not the time to teach a horse to load make sure you've got an evacuation route. Do so at least 72 hours in advance because what happens is if you wait until 24 hours before a large storm or hurricane were to hit, everybody's trying to evacuate. And what you don't want is to have a load of horses or a load of cattle in a trailer stuck on a freeway. It's also important to share plans with neighbors as well as relatives out of state. Be sure to keep an updated list of their contact information and addresses in case your cell phone becomes inaccessible. For any information related to local emergency management as well as preparedness and response training in your area, visit Mississippi Emergency Management Agency at msema.org. For a full Go Kit checklist, check out extension.msstate.edu, click on publications, and search the community section. If you're interested in large animal disaster response training, visit Mississippi State University's College of Veterinary Medicine website at cvm.msstate.edu and refer to the outreach section. I'm Amy Myers reporting. You'll want to be sure and tune in next week in part two of this series. I'll speak with an expert who will give you some ways to handle common livestock injuries that can occur during a disaster. Reporting in the studio, I'm Amy Myers. Layton, back to you. Thanks, Amy. We all know summertime in the South is hot. Staying hydrated is very important, but sometimes a glass of water just doesn't pack enough flavor. In this week's Food Factor segment, MSU Extension's Natasha Haynes tells us how to add some flavor to our H2O. There are two things you can count on during a Mississippi summer, heat and humidity. But you also need to plan on drinking lots and lots of water to stay hydrated. Here are some ways to jazz up your H2O. 
the practice of adding fruit to a pitcher of water has been around forever. But there's a whole new school of flavored water recipes out there that are all the rage this summer. Selections highlight fruit-flavored waters infused with crisp vegetables and pungent herbs and spices. These vitamin-charged beverages are almost as beautiful as they are delicious. Take, for example, this combination of sweet strawberries and tart lemons, offset with the distinctive licorice flavoring of fresh basil. Or this refreshing infusion of cucumbers, watermelon, and mint leaves. But my favorite choice for chilling in the summertime has got to be this blend of ruby red grapefruit slices, blueberries, and fresh rosemary. Hydration perfection. So experiment. Eight glasses of water are a lot easier to drink when they taste this good. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. For even more flavored water recipes, visit the Food Factor's Pinterest page. If gardening is a serious hobby for you, then you really take pride in your hard work. Well, don't be the only one enjoying it. Share it with all the butterflies and other pollinators who want to pay it a visit too. In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Eric Bachman tells us the most attractive plants, at least to a butterfly. It's all the gardening rage to plant flowers to attract butterflies and pollinators to our Mississippi gardens. Here are some of my favorites for the landscape. One of the stars of the butterfly garden has to be golden delicious pineapple sage. The foliage is a chartreuse yellow that really shines and shows off the tubular fire engine red flowers. Butterfly weed was chosen as a Mississippi medallion native plant in 2012. This plant grows a 36 inches tall and 24 inches wide. It has an upright clumping growth habit and produces clusters of tubular flowers with various shades of orange, yellow, or red that are magnets for monarch butterflies. Purple coneflowers are great native plants and one of the best plants you can grow in your garden to attract pollinators. Who can resist the two to four inch flowers with bright purple petals and dark center cones? Though named for the color purple, varieties are being developed with other colors. These Cheyenne Spirit Cone Flowers are beautiful with orange, yellow, and red flowers. I've always liked the varieties of cutting zinnia. The vivid colors including white, pink, yellow, and purple of these Benary Giants are impressive on the tall stems. It's amazing how many butterflies and bumblebees are also attracted to these flowers as they look for an easy meal. And here's an idea for next winter. Let some of your cool season greens go to flower, like this Hanover salad kale. This provides a snack for pollinators on warm days. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Time now for today's trivia quiz, and why don't we stick with the butterfly theme. Today's question, what is Mississippi's official state butterfly? Is it the morning cloak butterfly, the zebra long wing, the Viceroy Butterfly, or is it the Spicebush Swallowtail? Make your guess and Leighton will have the answer coming up in today's Market Report. And speaking of the Market Report, it's just a couple minutes away. Leighton will tell us about a chicken company laying more than eggs. They're laying out some big plans. Find out who it is and what they're up to. And in today's feature, we'll introduce you to two aspiring veterinarians. Meet a pair of sisters whose love for animals is eclipsed only by a love for one another. Hear why they've chosen this career path and what they hope to achieve. We're back after this. I've taken a lot of hits on the football field, but nothing has ever hit me as hard as cancer. I'm Dak Prescott and my mom died from colon cancer in 2013. I live every day thinking about the way she hurt. So be there for the ones you love and talk to your doctor about getting screened for colon cancer. 
Now it's the time when we shine the light on the families, farmers, and leaders that make Mississippi State University Extension one of the nation's best. Here's your Extension Spotlight. This week we're taking you to the Mississippi Homemaker Volunteers State Council. MHV club members are community volunteer leaders who meet various needs in their counties while strengthening families and educating young people. The clubs and memberships are spread across the state and come to Mississippi State University once a year for the annual state council. It's a four-day event packed with fun and fellowship. Attendees enjoy workshops, campus tours, games, the annual business meeting, and an awards banquet. One highlight is the display of cultural arts created by members. The MHV State Council is a time of renewing friendships and recognizing accomplishments of the past year. The clubs grew out of 4-H extension work and are one of the oldest organizations associated with MSU Extension. MHV will begin celebrating its 100th birthday next year. And that's this week's Extension Spotlight. It's time now for our weekly market segment. A chicken processor lays out plans for a test kitchen. Also in the news this week in the markets, a surprise for the hog trade in a new report just out. A new spinning mill is coming to the Mid-South, and soybean producers may want to do some risk management. A portion of the latest inventory of meat supplies in our nation's coolers sent a chill through some traders this week. Frozen pork supplies were up 9% from the previous month. Beef supplies dropped 1% from a month ago, while chicken stocks edged up 4% from the last report. A Georgia-based chicken processor is now building a research and development center and test kitchen in North Alabama. Wayne Farm says the $5 million facility in Decatur will open next year. Wayne operates a processing plant in Laurel, Mississippi, and has 10 other facilities. Also in neighboring Arkansas, a new cotton spinning mill is about to be built. China's largest textile manufacturer is renovating an existing industrial building in Forest City for this new facility. The mill will process more than 200,000 tons of cotton each year once it opens in mid-2018. 800 people will work there. Soybean production as well as demand are best described by many as being a little uncertain this year. One trader says you should be thinking about risk management. 17, 18 is going to look very much like this year. 930 as an average price. Last year in 17, uh, 955. So I think you still have to give the uh, soybeans uh, a chance uh, to go down into that 8 to 850 range. Okay. The upside, uh, $10, uh, you know, is a tough marker. Maybe you can get up to 1020. But you're certainly looking for uh, opportunities to uh, sell the, the, do some risk management. Back to the trivia quiz now as we wrap things up in the markets this week. We wanted to know Mississippi's official state butterfly. If you guessed D, the spice bush swallowtail, you got it right. It was designated Mississippi's state butterfly in 1991. The path to becoming a veterinarian is a long one. Obtaining an undergraduate college degree is only the beginning. Then comes the real work, four more years of graduate study. The task does become a little easier when you have a sibling studying veterinary medicine at the same time, one to share the ups and downs with. Just ask Jessica and Rachel Wilson of Pearl. They are sisters and are both currently enrolled in the College of Veterinary Medicine at Mississippi State. They recently shared the story of their journey into veterinary medicine with us. Jessica Wilson of Pearl, Mississippi completed her third year as a student in the College of Veterinary Medicine in 2017. It is a milestone of sorts on her continuing journey to become a veterinarian. The way our school is here at Mississippi State University, we do our first two years in classes, so we're taking classes the whole time in an auditorium, and we also have labs, but this year we've gotten to go down to the clinic, so that's been really exciting, getting to actually apply the knowledge you've been learning for two years. So it's been really fun getting to have that hands-on. 
Meanwhile, Jessica's sister, Rachel Wilson, wrapped up her first year in the College of Veterinary Medicine in May 2017. Early in the semester, like her sister Jessica before her, Rachel was a student worker for a research project on pasture asthma in horses. The sisters played a significant role in developing part of the technique used for screening the animals. It's called pulmonary function testing. They have to be conditioned to accept the equipment and that is something that both Rachel and her sister before her, Jessica, were very important in helping us to develop that whole technique. We didn't really know if we could get it done in the unsedated horses. They can sort of guide the horse in the right way and keep things under control. And because of their work, we were able to actually get a number of horses done now and we're actually testing um, patients, client animals for this condition. Horses and cattle are my favorite, definitely. They're my favorite species to work with. I've always enjoyed working with them. I showed actually um, on the equestrian team at Mississippi College, I jumped horses. So I've always enjoyed showing and working with horses and cattle. Both Rachel and Jessica received a Bachelor of Science degree in Animal and Dairy Science from Mississippi State prior to entering the College of Veterinary Medicine. Animals of one kind or another have been an important part of their lives as long as they can remember. My whole life, um, I've grown up around my mamaw's chickens. She always had a bunch of chickens and we had, my papa had some cows. My mamma and papa were very generous to let us have our horses and cattle at their farm in Pillahatchie. And that's really where my love of animals began. Rachel and Jessica's parents were also instrumental in establishing the girls' connection with animals. Extension's 4-H program also played an important role. My parents both, they spent so many hours and so much money just investing with sheep and bunnies and ferrets, all kinds of animals, you can name it. We had like a zoo at our house. And we also had horses and some sheep that we would show at 4-H. And 4-H just, I guess, got me very excited about agriculture and it's just kind of what made me start thinking about vet medicine for me. Um, the first thing that we actually did that made me really start thinking about being a veterinarian, we came to one of the open houses here for the spring and our little 4-H group came and it was so cool. I was like, this is definitely what I need to be doing. This showing in 4-H and county fairs and livestock shows, that really just introduced my passion and it opened doors and connections to veterinarians and it just made me realize that that's what I wanted to do. Even with hectic days as veterinary students, the sisters make time to give back to their hometown as community volunteers. Their hope is to encourage and interest other young people to follow in their footsteps through 4-H and livestock activities. I'm from Rankin County and I volunteer for our county livestock shows. And in the past, I'd been receiving a scholarship, so I would also put a um, workshop on. I did a lamb workshop one year. So it was fun getting to interact with the kids and teach them things that you think's cool and they think it's cool, so it's just really fun. I help with my Rankin County um, livestock shows as an alumni. I go and I basically just hand out ribbons, announce, do anything they need to help volunteer with the show and get it running and going. Rachel and Jessica say they hope to make an impact on veterinary medicine and agriculture through their future efforts beyond graduation. Their dream job would be to open a private practice with each other. However, they each realize that may have to wait a little while after graduation. I hope to graduate and move back home to where I'm from in central Mississippi area and open my own mixed animal practice. And that's going to be a long time down the road because I'd first just like to find a job, honestly, but um, I would really prefer to work in mixed animal. Like I love farm animals and I love companion animals, so it's just, I don't know, it seems like a good fit for me since I've grown up around that my whole life. I'm really interested in rural medicine whenever, you know, like the one little vet kind of in the county. So I don't know, we'll see how that goes. I would like to work for either a practice open a mobile veterinary clinic for large animal emergency cases. I would love to do that. And also I'm contemplating working for the USDA with food safety and public health. So helping the agricultural community and giving back to farmers and helping them to improve their livestock and supply society's demands. In the meantime, Rachel and Jessica rely on each other a lot as they continue their studies in the College of Veterinary Medicine. They continue to be thankful they can share the experience together at the same time. Well, it was always our dream, but I was always kind of skeptical and wondered if it would really happen. 
Don't we're really pretty similar, but we're also different at the same time. We handle situations differently, probably. But um, at the same time, we're very similar. We've shared things a whole lot. We both have a lot of strengths and weaknesses. So us living together, especially, we've moved in this past year. I think it's helped a lot for us to rely on each other and try to work together as a team to try to get stuff done, especially around the house and with the pack of animals that we've brought up to Starkville. So we've definitely helped each other a lot. Is my confident. She is my role model. She's one of my best friends and I look up to her daily. I constantly am going to her asking her for advice and she's always eager to help and always very nice and a great sister. <laughs> Along with other scholarships, both sisters also won the Diane Evans Memorial Scholarship from Mississippi Women for Agriculture, a program of MSU Extension. They take nothing for granted and realize how special this time is in their lives. It's amazing and God has truly blessed both of us with such a wonderful opportunity. I'm Leighton Span reporting. And Troy, in case you're wondering, Jessica and Rachel are not the first pair of siblings to be enrolled in the College of Veterinary Medicine at MSU. And I bet they will not be the last. Look like a couple of great ladies there. We appreciate them talking to us and we really enjoyed that story. Thank you. That's gonna about wrap it up for this week's show. But uh, we do have a couple things to tell you about in, in advance of next week, though. And we also want to tell you that this is Troy's birthday and wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes. Oh, what do we, fact, have? We, oh we have a in cake. In fact, I got you a cake. Oh, we I have got a you cake. A cake. Oh, I, look at that. Happy birthday, Troy. Oh, that's me. Well, hey, real quick before we run out of time, we'll have Amy's part two of her disaster story about livestock uh, preparation. And we're going to be talking with Sonny Purdue, the new Ag Secretary. He's in town as well. So in the meantime, let's eat some cake. Yeah. We'll see you next week.